So we're in the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. And uh, this morning's reading is from chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Uh, Hear now God's word to us. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor, second time the word's used, with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will become called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me according to to your word. Then the angel left her. May God bless the reading and the teaching and the hearing and the living out of this, his living word. So we are thinking about wonder, the wonder of Christmas in this four-week sermon series. Uh, Wonder is about hope. Wonder is about uh, mystery. Wonder is about amazement. And when you wonder... When things don't fully make sense, you wonder, you ask questions. So I I love this. In the first chapter of Luke, there are four questions that are asked by uh, people used of God, and they are historical questions in that context, but they're questions for me and you as well. I think the term is they, 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 they leap over these 2,000 years because they're questions that you and I ask during different seasons of our life. The first question we looked at last week was by Zechariah. As an old man, he is told his wife is going to bear a son, and he asks the question, how can I be sure? It's the question for certainty. The second question was um, uh, that we'll look at next week is, is this. What then is this child going to be? It's the question of character. What then is this child going to be? We ask our high school and college kids, what are you going to do? Doing is important, but next week we'll think about this question, what I call the question of character. What then, what is this child going to be? Uh, In two weeks, uh, Reverend Libby Vincent, who is an amazing preacher, don't miss that Sunday, I'll be here too, but um, she'll be here with us. She's going to look at the fourth question, and that's the question that I'm calling the question of care. Why do you care so much about me? And um, this question was asked. How, um, where are we? Yeah, why am I so favored? Why am I so favored? Elizabeth asked. And then the question this morning is, how will this be? It's the question of clarity. What, what, what Mary is asking is, help me understand. Uh, this is confusing for me. Help me understand. And again, all of these questions were for there and then, but they're for here and now as well. I mean, don't you ask, how can this be? How can this be? Is a question that we ask when life doesn't align the way we had hoped it would be. How can this be is a question we ask when things are starting to fall apart, when life is out of control. Perhaps some sort of change has happened in your life, a a job or a health situation or a relationship or your, your health, and it keeps you up at night. And you say, how did I get here? How did we get here? How did, how did we drift 
Just slowly. When did this happen? How, how can this be? Help me, help me understand. Now, in the telling of the Christmas story, these biblical characters can often feel larger than life. We think of the courage of Joseph or the um, obedience of Mary or the arduous journey of the wise men. And we kind of put them on stained glass windows with this halo over their head and their, and their faces glowing as if they're otherworldly. But Joseph and Mary and the shepherds and the wise men are kind of common people. They're ordinary people that were used in extraordinary ways because they took steps of faith. They took steps of faith. Ordinary people, just like you and me, used in extraordinary ways because they stepped out in faith. Now, certainly God uses great people uh, with great gifts to do great things, but more often it seems to me that God uses ordinary people with gifts, you and me, uh, in ordinary ways or in extraordinary ways when we step out in faith, when we trust. And that's what we're going to think about today. We're people of faith. We are called to live by faith and not by sight. We do not want the nickname that Jesus gave his disciples, which was? You're listening to my sermons. It's awesome. Or you know it. You have little faith. It's not a compliment. You have little faith. You have little faith. Glad you're here this morning. No, that's not a compliment. Jesus wants us to be people of faith. How important is faith? We talked about this last week. The author of Hebrews writes these words, and without faith, it's impossible. Impossible is a strong word, is it not? And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so it seems to me if our life goal is to please God, is to honor him, to be blessed by him, to be a blessing to other people, we should think about faith. And that's what we're going to do this morning. What is faith? Maybe you've heard this story. Uh, you will hear it again, I'm sure. What is faith? A little boy raised his hand. I know what faith is. Faith is believing in something you know isn't true. A lot of people think that's what faith is like. A lot of people think that faith is believing in something, remember from last week, that you know isn't true. You just do it anyway because you have faith. That's not faith. That's foolishness. Again, the author of Hebrews defines faith for us, and I love this definition. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of what we do not see. Faith has assurance. See the highlighted in yellow. Faith has assurance. Faith has evidence. Faith is not a blind leap into the dark. Just believe, just believe. No. We can have assurance. We can have some evidence. And in our story today, Mary's going to get some evidence, as we'll see later. And that's what our question is about. How can this be? Help me understand how I can become pregnant if I'm still a virgin and going to be a virgin when I get pregnant. Uh, can you help me understand? And she gets some assurance. She gets some evidence in three areas. An angel speaks to her, an explanation and a sign. An angel, explanation, and a sign. One, she gets some assurance because the angel Gabriel appeared. Uh, and then she gets an explanation. Ready for the explanation? The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Uh, okay. I didn't say it was overwhelming evidence. There's, there's a hint. And then she gets a sign. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Even Elizabeth, the angel says to Mary, you, you know your, your cousin who's well along in years, 70, 80 maybe? Even she is going to have the impossible happen to her. And we'll see what Mary does with that. So she gets some assurance. She gets some evidence Ah, uh, yeah, that's good. There you go. She gets some assurance and some evidence. Um, but would that be enough to convince her? No. 
No, but she gets some help. And so faith has meaning, but faith also has mystery. And that's why I like this definition again. It's hoped for, and it's something we do not see. So there is some assurance. There is some evidence. That's faith. But, but, but it's still a mystery. Uh, faith is reasonable, but it's also a trust. It is a step of faith, but not a blind step in the darkness. It's a, it's a step moving towards light. And I like the definition of faith. Faith is a reasonable trust. A reasonable trust. So Mary can teach us three things about faith. And I want to think about that. First is faith and doubt must coexist. It's not faith and doubt sometimes exist. Faith has to have doubt in it for faith to be operative in our life. Faith and doubt must coexist. So rewind the story. Mary's 12 years old, 13 year old, years old, most scholars think. She's going about her business, and the angel Gabriel, the same age, uh, angel that showed up to Zechariah, she comes to Mary and says, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Okay, so if an angel comes to you and says, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you, what do you think? What are you feeling? Rhetorical question. I'm thinking, I'm highly favored. God is with me. Super. I, I, I like this. For 14 years, I haven't had an administrative assistant named Deanna Pence. And um, there were times during those 14 years where I needed something extra done at the last minute. And it would be a last minute push. And I would come in and I would say something like this. Deanna, buddy, pal, great servant of God, gifted in many areas, godly, with gifts supreme. How are you? And she would always say something like, yeah, 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 yeah. What do you want? I'm sure Mary knew something was up right away when the angel says, greetings, you are highly favored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what's up? Luke writes this. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, what kind of greeting might this be? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor, there's that word again, with God. Again, Gabriel said, you're highly favored, you have found favor with God. Now again, if something's favored by you, how do you treat it? If something's favored by you, how do you treat it? You get a, a box of chocolates, seized chocolates, let's say, at Christmas time. And you know, you probably like all of them, but there's some that you don't, you know. Would you like this one? No, no, not that one. This one in the corner, you know, the coconut crunch, wow, licorice thing. But you have some favorite ones. How do you treat those favorite ones? You cuddle them and coddle them. You, you hide them. Because those are for you. You treat them with, with, with extra care. If you're a teacher, you know, you, you like your kids, but, but, but you usually have a, at least a couple, I hope, that are kind of your favorites. How do you treat them? Perhaps with extra care, carefully. I was a camp counselor one summer, and I spent 10 weeks with 10 10-year-olds, 10, 10, 10. And uh, I, I really did enjoy all the kids, for the most part. Um, but there were two especially that I especially liked, and you know, I favored them. So Mary, when she's heard, heard she's highly favored, I wondered if she would expect, I'm going to get special attention. In one sense, she would. But when you hear God is with you, oh, he's with me to protect me and to help me. Here's what she got. Gabriel continued, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Okay, okay. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Okay, so my kid's going to be most high. My kid's going to be called the son of God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. David, you mean like the king of Israel, the, the, the biggest, best, most powerful king? My son's going to get that throne. That will come with it some consequences. And by the way, uh, I am betrothed to Joseph, which in their culture was you were married and now I'm going to be pregnant. How are they going to treat me and how are they going to treat Joseph? I thought I was favored. 
And the angel Gabriel goes on, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And maybe she thinks, you know, uh, you got the wrong girl. I'm kind of a country girl from a no-name town. I'm like 12 years old. Didn't you want a, a girl of higher prestige from Jerusalem, the city, not from wherever? And then it hits her, and she asks this, whoa, 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 whoa. how will this all be since I'm a virgin? Help me understand. This, this makes no sense to me. I mean, how could it? How could it? It makes no sense to us. How can a virgin conceive? And so faith is not the absence of questions. Faith is not the absence of fear. All over the Christmas stories, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Living by faith is the absence of control. It is not the absence of doubt. In fact, faith needs doubt. In fact, without doubt, you would have no need for faith. Without doubt, you would have no need for faith. Need a volunteer. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse? Yeah. I have $20 in my hand. Do you believe, do you have faith I have $20 in my hand? Yes. The answer is yes. I have $20. How much faith did he have to have? Zero. Why? Because there was no doubt. I'm keeping my $20. <laughs> right? But I need a volunteer, someone who has $10 on them or $20. I'll go for five. <laughs> I need a volunteer. Do you have a volunteer? Come on up. Can you, do you mind? Thank you. Thank you. This is Sam. Say hi to Sam. Hi, Sam. All right, Sam. Can I have you $10? Yes. Now. Do I stay up here? Do I stay yeah, please, <laughs> please, please. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have $100 in this hand. But if I do, you get the $100. And you get your 10 back. If I don't, I keep the 10 and you lose. Sounds like gambling. <laughs> Cut that from the tape, too, please. So, do you believe, do you have faith, I have $100 in this hand? Yes. Yes! Why do you say yes? Because the worst that will happen is I'll lose 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. and, but the best that could happen is I get a What kind of assurance do, do you have <laughs> that I have $100 in my hand? Sure. What kind of assurance do you have? I mean, I'm not too sure, but probably very little. Do you have any assurance? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have some assurance. Yeah. I'm not a crook. Yeah. <laughs> or hard. Right? You have some assurance? Mm -hmm. What, what else assurance might she have? Help her out. We're in church. I'm not going to embarrass you. Or would I to make a point? So you do have faith. Are you willing to risk that I have $100? Yeah. yeah. You are? Mm -hmm. I have $1 bill. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. It is a $100 bill. Remember, it is more blessed to give than receive. <laughs> And the offering basket's still out in the back. <laughs> Give her a hand. Do you got it? When, when, when you have no doubt, you don't need any faith. But when there's doubt, you, 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 you trust based on some assurance. The best one was my character. <clears throat> and the context, right? But that's what faith is. Faith must have doubt. So when you doubt, it's not a bad thing. Remember Doubting Thomas? I hate that nickname. It's not a good nickname because he was believing Thomas, but he got through belief. He made one of the greatest faith statements of any of the disciples. My Lord and my God, but he got there through doubt. Through 
doubt. One of my favorite authors, John Ortberg, writes this book. His book is Faith and Doubt, and he writes these words. It's a long quote again, so just follow along and listen. He says, I will tell you my secret. I have doubts. I have spent my life studying and thinking and reading and teaching about God. I grew up in the church. I went to a faith-based college, and then I went to seminary. I walked the straight and narrow. I've never sowed any wild oats. And I have doubts, he writes. I tell you more than that. I'll tell you more than that. There's a part of me that after I die, if it all turns out to be true, you know, the angels are singing, death is defeated, the roll is called up yonder, and there I am. There is a part of me that will be surprised. He's a pastor. What do you know? It's true after all. I had my doubts. Is it okay if we ask questions and consider objections and wonder out loud? Is it okay if we don't pretend that everybody is split up into two camps, those who doubt and those who don't? Is it possible, maybe even rational, to have faith in the presence of doubt? Because I have faith too, and I have bet the farm. This is a book with the not very catchy title, Faith and Doubt, and the most important word in the title is the one in the middle. Because most people I know are a mix of the two. What Mary teaches us in this passage is faith and doubt must coexist. Number two, God is faithful. God is faithful. Mary put her faith, not in her faith, but in the faithfulness of God. Mary put her faith, not in her faith. It's important to have great faith. But most of us, honestly, are little faith people. But God still uses little faith people. When we trust the faithfulness of God, it's not the amount of faith. It's the object of our faith. It's not that we have a, a great, glorious, awesome, wonderful faith in God. It's that we have faith in a great, glorious, wonderful, awesome God. It's not the amount. It's the object. I used to live in Pennsylvania, uh, and when I was a young boy, I'd go out on wintry days, and I tried to. Pers I brought my brother, my two younger brothers, with me. And there's a little pond outside of our house, uh, and it was frozen. And I tried to uh, um, tell my brothers to come on out in the pond with me. I got in the pond. I said, "I said the f the pond is probably this thick. It will not, you know, fall through. You're not going to fall into that. I have great faith in this pond. You can hear it coming, can't you?" And so I, I jumped up and down on the ice. I said, this thing will not. They would not come out with me. I took a stick, and I literally started going, it will not break. And I started to go like this. It will not. <laughs> I froze, and all they did was stand around and laugh. Not that I'm bitter years later. <laughs> what happened? I had, I had great, tremendous faith in that pond, but it was not correct. Years later, lived in Chicago, and I would uh, go up to Lake Geneva in Wisconsin, and it's frozen over. That's a picture of Lake Geneva. And um, it gets so frozen that people drive their cars on there, and one day I was driving up there with a friend. He said, hey, let's drive our car up on the lake. Well, remembering my previous experience, with judging how strong frozen water can be. I said, no thanks, because I had this in my mind. This is what happens sometimes when people drive their cars out there. They sink. And so I said, no, I, I do not have faith that this, uh, that this lake is going to hold our, our car. But as we drove around, we saw several cars out there. And so we decided to go out on the lake. And we had a great time. End of story point is this. I had much greater faith in the first pond than in the second lake. But it didn't matter how much faith I had because the object wasn't right. You can have great, 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 great faith in the wrong object and it doesn't matter. But if we have little faith in the right object, God, 
It makes all the difference from the because God will use little faith. Why? It's not the amount of our faith, it's the faithfulness of God. And that's what Mary did. Number three thing we can learn. Number one is faith and doubt coexist, must coexist. God is faithful, and the last point is we must act. When God calls us to do something, we will more than likely feel fear. One of your Bible studies is in Exodus to the call of Moses. Moses does not want to lead God's people out of Egypt. And, he, and he, five times he gives excuse after excuse after excuse. His last one is, can you just send someone else? But we must act. When Mary was told that Elizabeth was pregnant, some assurance, she wanted to go see for herself. And Luke writes these words, at that time, Mary got ready and rushed to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard, Mary, Mary, heard Mary's greetings, the baby leapt in her womb. She wanted to see for herself. Remember when the tomb was empty and Peter shows up? The angel doesn't say, stop and just believe, believe, believe. He said, no, come and see. Check it out yourself. So we'll get some assurance but a lot of times we have to act on what we've been given and we, more than not, will be given more. Make sense? We've got to be people of action. When God calls this church to do what God's going to call us to do, we need to act. We need to plan. We need to pray. We need to strategize. But we're not going to have this full sense of, oh, this will work 100%. No, we have to take steps of faith. Peter walking on water, he had to act. The shepherds, they heard from the angels, but they went to Bethlehem to see. That's why I love the hymn. Come to Bethlehem and see for yourself. Act, do something. Because you don't really believe something until you act. I want to close with, with uh, Hebrews again. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And God rewards those who diligently seek him. We must act. Here's some questions I'd like you to think about the rest of the day or this week with someone else or in a small group. Number one, when in your life, when in your life do you sense God calling you to do something and how did you respond? When in your life did you sense God calling you to do something? To make a phone call, to say I'm sorry, to write a check, to go someplace? And how did you respond? Number two, of the three points in the sermon this morning, faith and doubt must coexist. God is faithful, we must act. Which one made the biggest impression upon you and why do you think this was so? And number three, where and what do you think God might be calling you to do? Where do you think God's calling you? What's God saying to you? Are you open to the Spirit of God? And may you respond like Mary. May it be to me according to your word. When God calls you, you're going to say, how can, how can this be? Help me understand. He'll give you some reassurance, but he wants you and me and us as a church to take steps of faith. Will you? Will we?